welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm filming on Saturday today because I have this is the only day I've been managed to fit in uh, some filming um, with everything else that's going on. Um, in this video, um, I, I wanted I do want to review um, a book, and and there's another I wanted to review a book on um, pancakes because it's been pancake week this week. Um, so I have been making I made pancakes on pancake, but on pancake day, which is on Tuesday, obviously, but after pancake day now. Um, although I make pancakes any time of year, so. But I did make pancakes on Tuesday as it's traditional. I made um, lemon crepes or lemon crunch crepes out of my, um, it's a recipe in my new uh, pancake book um, called Flipping Good that I got recently uh, with various pancakes recipes in it. And they were very thin um, crepes that I made with uh, lemon juice and I also added some grated lemon zest that I mixed with a bit of demerara sugar. Um, and I had that with them as well and I sort of rolled them up and they came out really well. I made um, six very thin wholemeal crepes and I had the remainder for breakfast the next day. They were, they were just as good as new actually, um, warmed up in the microwave. So they were really good and I might make some more pancakes tomorrow, even though obviously it'll be past pancake day now. So technically it's no longer traditional, but you know, got into the sort of pancake making spirit. So I might make some more on Sunday. Um, tomorrow. And um, I'd been reading a book about pancakes. So I'd like to review that in, in the video um, in the next video, um, and I haven't forgotten uh, that, of course, one of you would like me to review the book on sloths that I've um, been reading recently. So that is in the pipeline, so don't worry, I will be reviewing that book very soon. Um, it's just because pa it's been pancake day, so I thought that'd be more topical, so I'll be doing that this week. But in this video, before we get on to that, I just really wanted to talk about something that's been on my mind lately in connection to the whole COVID situation. So in the UK at the moment, we are um, still in lockdown, um, the third lockdown and the second like big lockdown where everything's been shut down. Um, and um, I think we should be coming out of that lockdown in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm not entirely sure when we're going to be coming out of it completely. I think it'll be sort of a gradual process of um, releasing restrictions. And they've been vaccinating um, elderly people, so people over the age of 80, and and then they start and then they vaccinated people over the age of seventy I think something like that. My dad's had his first vaccination because um, you need to have two shots. My dad's second one will be in May. They've also started vaccinating the over fifties, and I think they've been vaccinating people with severe clinical conditions to make them clinically, um, physically vulnerable to COVID. So things like I don't know heart disease, severe asthma, diabetes, or any um, you know conditions that affect your immune system, anything that makes someone, say, more physically vulnerable to COVID, they've been vaccinating those people and also they've been vaccinating people who work in care homes and um, healthcare workers. Um, and they're sort of doing it in a sort of graded approach. So the majority of the population, those who don't have underlying physical issues or those who don't work in kind of key line work, um, will hopefully get done later on this year. I'm not entirely sure when. Um, but of course you need two doses for it to be like completely effective. Now this is what my point I want to get on to. Um, there's been a lot of discussion recently in the news about people with uh, learning disabilities because people with learning disabilities, that's in, if you're listening from the US by the way, it's a little bit confusing because in the US um, that is uh, known as intellectual disability, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's intellectual disability. But in the UK, we talk about learning disabilities. Um, it's a little bit confusing because in the US, I think learning disability over there refers more to people with things like dyslexia and things like that. Whereas in this country, people with dyslexia are said to, in the UK, that is, people with dyslexia are said to have specific learning difficulties, not learning disabilities. But in the US, it's referred to as learning disability, which actually in a way makes more sense. I actually think calling it a learning disability makes more sense in a way, because after all, things like dyslexia do affect someone's learning and can be disabling. But in the UK, we call them learning difficulties just to, to sort of distinguish it from learning disability. But in the U US, a learning disability is what's called an intellectual disability. In the UK, it's called a learning disability. So a learning disability in the UK or an intellectual disability in the US is basically when someone has a global intelligence below 70 combined with um, a severely diminished ability to kind of um, go about their sort of day-to-day -day lives. Um, you know, it affects a whole range of different functional skills. But And of course, it comes in, a, in different degrees of severity from someone who's very mildly learning disabled right through to someone who's severe and profoundly learning disabled. So there's been a lot of debate recently in the UK about people with learning disabilities, um, whether or not they should have priority access to the vaccine on the grounds that um, they tend to experience worse health outcomes 
for a range of different reasons. For some of them, it's because they have there's a high tendency for them to have uh, coexisting conditions alongside their learning disability, and that's particularly the case for people with Down syndrome, which is one of the leading causes of learning disability. Someone with Down syndrome um, often ha they often have like heart disease and other things like that um, as part of the picture, which can obviously make them more at risk of COVID. Um, but also, um, people with learning disabilities, they might not be able to communicate their needs so clearly. They might. They just tend to have worse health outcomes and are more likely to die from a range of different diseases, not just COVID. Um, so there's been a lot of pressure of saying, you know, that these people should be made priority. I think they're just. I, I think, but I'm not entirely sure because I haven't really been keeping up to speed with it. But I think those with very severe and profound learning disabilities are in the, the priority group that's coming up next for vaccines. So they're the ones that are due to be vaccinated next. Now, this brings me on to my point. Now, autism is not considered is not get considered to be a priority for vaccination in and of itself. So, if you're just autistic without a learning disability, um, you're not considered to be priority for vaccination. You're put at the back of the queue with everyone else. Um, now, I've been thinking about this lately, and I actually think that this is wrong. The reason being is that while I think that people who are autistic should, of course, um, go behind people with physical conditions, you know, that put them at physical, literally at risk of dying from COVID, they obviously should come first, and that's right and proper. But I, I do think that people with autism should be putting a priority ban with those with severe learning disabilities. Because although autism is not a learning disability, it can very often go hand in hand with learning disabilities, but being autistic in and of itself is not a learning disability. You know, it doesn't, autism in and of itself does not affect someone's you know, you can have, you could be, what I mean is, it doesn't in and of itself affect someone's intelligence, but autistic people come in, have all different, a whole range, it covers a whole range of intelligence, right through from someone with severe profound learning disability, up to someone who's gone to Oxford University and has a PhD, you know, it covers a vast range of intelligence. Um, but I, I do think, though, that being autistic is actually a risk factor, um, for COVID, um, on a similar sort of level to those with learning disabilities um because and not just autism i would also say that anyone who's got a severe um and chronic something that you're going to have for the rest of your life but like a severe chronic kind of like mental condition so that might also include say things like bipolar anorexia nervosa severe ocd anything that makes a person essentially affect someone's functional skills, maybe affects their ability to function independently where they need a lot of support, um, or that might affect their ability to communicate to other people their, um, what's going on for them, um, actually should also be a priority for vaccination ahead of, say, the general population of people. So in terms of priority, I would say that it should be in the same bracket as those with the severe learning disabilities. But for the bracket that includes severe learning disabilities, it should also include autism and severe mental health conditions. It should go in the same bracket is what I'm saying. The reason what I think is, as I said, I've already mentioned some of the reasons, but on a very personal level, while I'm not physically vulnerable to COVID on a physical level, you know, I don't have, I'm, I'm reasonably young, I don't have any uh, physical health problems that might put me at risk of COVID. Um, but I do, but I do, um, I am vulnerable um, on a mental level to getting ill in the sense that illness, um, even mild illness, even if I were to get COVID mildly, this would affect me in a way that a person who doesn't have my problems might not affect. And that in and of itself could affect my recovery. Even if I were to get a very mild infection, that, um, and I've experienced this, you know, just with something as benign and simple as a sore throat, okay? That can give me panic attacks, it can make me bed bound, and it can so severely affect my functioning that I'm basically incapacitated. Whereas a person without my difficulties, that, they, that wouldn't be a problem for them. They'd be able to get up, go about their day-to-day -day lives, you know, go down to the shops, those sort of things with a slight sore throat. For me, I'll be in bed. And that's, for that, is because my sensory perception is heightened. I'm very, very sensitive to pain. So even a very mild illness, for me, can be really painful. Not because the illness itself is bad, or that, you know, I've got a good immune system. It's got nothing to do with my physical um, health. It's to do with the fact that mentally i find it really hard to deal with so it affects my routine it's change it it's it's a change from normal and it and it really ramps up my anxiety and stress levels 
And that can then have an impact on my mental health for weeks after the illness because it has a really destabilising effect. So then if you're talking about something like COVID, even if I were to get a mild, mild in a case, you know, which actually to me would be pretty severe because it would be unlike anything I've ever experienced, that to me would be really, really bad for my mental health. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I feel mentally vulnerable and why I have, I mean, obviously I have OCD, so there's that as well. But that's one of the reasons why I have been shielding myself unofficially, because obviously, you know, I'm not on any official shielding list because I'm considered to be not priority. But I've been, um, yeah, men, I've been taking a personal decision to shield myself. And I've been doing that since last March. I've been living a lockdown existence because I know that if I were to catch COVID, it could have a really bad impact on my mental health. And also, of course, it because, because I deal with illness really badly, in a sense of mental problems, that of course could affect my recovery from COVID because I'll be having panic attacks, which of course, if it's a condition that could potentially affect your ability to breathe, would not be very good. Um, so that this is one of the reasons why I do feel vulnerable and, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. And I do feel therefore that people with autism and people with severe mental health problems should be put in a priority band for vaccination before the general population obviously after those with physical problems they obviously come first and after the elderly they come first obviously and that's only right and proper because they are at the most at risk and that's already been done and that's been happening but they should be in the same they should be in the next band we should be in the next band alongside those with learning disabilities um in priority we should come before the general population who don't have these issues um we should be considered a similar priority to, like, say, key workers and that sort of priority level. We're not as high as key workers, actually, because they're done first, aren't they? But people like people with a learning disability, it's the next priority band, basically, because they're talking about vaccinating teachers and stuff. But, you know, if they're, if teachers are priority, and so should people with autism, I think, um, for different reasons, obviously. I just think I just think that should be the case. Um, but I'm not aware of autism being considered a priority. And the other issue is that autistic people are known to have worse health, comes and health outcomes anyway, for a similar reason as those with learning disabilities. Regardless of whether or not you have a learning disability, if you're autistic, you have worse health outcomes on average. We're more likely to die from cancer. We're more likely to die from heart disease. Not because necessarily we're more prone to cancer or heart disease, although obviously, say, I guess maybe the severe stress of being autistic um, and also some autistic people might not... You know, there could be a whole range of reasons that might actually make you more risk for some of these diseases, just because of the stress and strain of being autistic, for one, could potentially make you more risk of heart disease, for example. But, um, but I think the actual main reason for why autistic people are more at risk of these dying from these diseases is because we, we're not very good at communicating our uh, health needs. We struggle with communication. So when I'm ill, for example, I can look completely fine because I'm not very good at communicating to someone how that I'm ill because I can't I'm not very good at doing that to so someone else might think oh guess she's fine she doesn't need treatment because but because I'm not very good at communicating that and that's one of the reasons why and I've done research on this why autistic people are more likely to die from the same conditions that non-autistics aren't because we're more vulnerable um so that's one of the reasons again considering I already know this with other diseases why I think autistic and I also think autistics should also get access to the flu vaccine as well because they give the flu vaccine free on the NHS to people with learning disabilities but strangely not to people with autism which I think is quite strange considering that autistics as a group are more prone to having worse health outcomes if they were to get severely ill from one of these diseases for example so do let me know what you think about this should autistics be given a be put into a priority for vaccination alongside those learning disabilities do let me know okay so i'm going to be moving on now to uh video number two where i'm going to be reviewing um pancake a global history so moving on to video number two now <laughs> 